This is uh, a, a paleosol, a fossil soil on the right with uh, one of my colleagues in Ethiopia, and this is known as a vertisol. And uh, uh, I'm standing here on a vertisol. That's a vertisol that took about an hour, no, it took about eight hours to get or to go one kilometer across that vertisol in a rainstorm. Um, and as for those of you who know Frank Brown, that's Frank Brown in the in the puddles trying to clean off his his feet. Um, so I've been working on soils for quite some time, and so that's that's kind of the topic of this talk. So I'm going to talk about a few things, and I'm going to start uh, by talking about some things that are near and dear to my heart and should be near and dear to your heart if you want to go very far in things. So I'm going to spend a little bit of a side light talking about diffusion. We've talked a whole bunch about diffusion uh, in, this, in this class. And I want to make a, there's a couple of important points that I'd kind of like to make about that. And then I want to return and talk about carbonate chemistry, uh, which is really equilibrium in this really complicated system that's really just CO2, water, and calcium. Um, and uh, how we introduced you somewhat to that, but I want to spend a little bit more time and emphasize some things. And I know that group two needs to be able to do some of these things and think about, uh, think about this space. So we'll start there. So some generalities for diffusion. Uh, diffusion coefficients are uh, a very weak uh, function of, of uh, temperature. And if we consider the diffusion of gases, the significant thing, so the, the units of diffusion are centimeters squared per second. Okay, so it's not really a physical thing that really makes much sense, but we're interested in the notion of if we have some, if we release some gaseous molecules here, they're bouncing against other molecules and they will eventually diffuse throughout the, the room. And the real key to remembering diffusion is that nature hates a gradient. And so the whole notion of diffusion is to get rid of concentration gradients. And it's really from this molecules just bouncing around uh, with the kinetic energy that they have. So we see that the diffusion coefficient from 0 to 30 degrees Celsius is a very weak function of temperature. So temperature is not a main player. But a really significant thing is the difference in the diffusion coefficient between air and water. Okay, it's four orders of magnitude different so that diffusion of gases, and this is diffusion of gases, diffusion of gases in air, the diffusion coefficient is about four orders of magnitude higher than the diffusion uh, in, in water. Well, there's a, it turns out that, that when you actually solve the, the differential equation that, that controls diffusion, there's a dimensionless constant that shows up. And the dimensionless constant is L squared equal to 4 dt, where L is a distance and t is time. Okay? And, and it turns out that we can do this for different geometries. We can do it for a spherical geometry, for a planar geometry, for all sorts of things, but it, in a cylinder. But the only difference is, is that two might really effectively be three or 1.5 or something. So, so, so uh, for whatever geometry you're doing, this is an extremely good approximation. And this thought process I want to walk through in the next few minutes, I hope will illustrate some issues. So what we like to do is think about the relationship between the characteristic time t and the characteristic length. So the question you'll often be asking yourself is, well, on the length scale that I'm interested in, is diffusion even important? Because if we need to solve for diffusion and we need to actually solve the differential equation, it's a mess. Okay, it's a lot of work, especially if you've got chemical reactions and first order rate constants and, and an advection term. So it's really nice to know, is this important or not? So we can solve this and look at these relationships. And so on the right side of the diagram, I just saw, well, if your time scale is an hour that's relevant to your problem, okay, then what is the characteristic length? 
Okay, and the way diffusion works, this is a power function, this is an exponential function, that's where this term always shows up. So Wally Broker refers it to as the folding length or the folding time. And so basically you get one over E to equilibrium. So you need to, your characteristic, or the, the time you're really is important. So it's like four or five characteristic times is, is all you need to worry about. But so an hour. So what is the time scale or the, or the length scale that's important? Well, in air, we follow over on the, on the, on the line, you can see that, well, in, in, in an hour, diffusion is important on a, time, on a length scale of 10 or so centimeters, okay? So if your length scale is, you know, from here to downtown, diffusion's not important. Completely ignore it, okay? Um, if you're in water, but, but if, if we, your length scale that you're important is, is 10 centimeters, well then you better be considering diffusion. Okay, and that means if you do, like if you sample something, like if you sample soil air, then you have to think, well, if I'm gonna sample soil air, I'm gonna disturb the volume, and 10 centimeters is probably what we're worried about. So, so maybe you're, if you disturb a sample, you shouldn't come back and resample that until your characteristic distance is, is, is taken care of. Well, an hour for water, the characteristic length is, is less than a centimeter. It's more like a millimeter. So in water, uh, and, and things don't get very far, and that's because it's two orders of magnitude different, okay? So, in, and we think of these diffusion scales on different, on different lengths, um, and that's because, uh, that's because we're constantly looking at, at, at different problems. So, where does this come with respect to some of the things that we've been talking about? And I'd just like to consider photosynthesis. So, let's consider photosynthesis. And we're just going to say, well, um, how important is diffusion for carbon dioxide getting to the surface of a plant where it can be assimilated? And so let's just consider a characteristic volume. And so we have a, an area. And so then the characteristic length of diffusion is this little tiny gray box on top. Okay. And <clears throat> I'm going to take this value of 10 micromoles per meter squared per second. This is kind of a typical diffusion. This is, you know, a plant cranking along at a reasonable sort of rate. So this is the sort of photosynthetic rates that you find often in nature. So how important is diffusional supply of CO2 to your leaf surface? Well, we can run through this really quickly and just say, well, how much CO2 is available? Well, air, so here's the two calculations, air on the left, water on the right. Air has a diffusion coefficient, you can see, 1 point, uh, uh, 0.14 centimeters squared per second. Water is about two times 10 to the minus fifth, so it's <coughs> four orders of magnitude smaller. So we solve for L squared equals four dt. And we're going to consider a second. So we're going to be interested in how much CO2 can be supplied by diffusion in over this time. And so we find for air, uh, our characteristic length is four and a half millimeters. That's the characteristic length for one second. Uh, for water, wow, look at that. It's, it's 100 microns, 89 microns. So for water, a subaqueous material, I mean a subaqueous plant, would have just this very thin skin of CO2. Well, how much CO2 is in that skin that's either 100 microns or 7.5 millimeters? Well, we know the concentration. When I made this slide a bunch of years ago in this class, uh, it was 350 micromoles per mole. Now it's 400. So we're doing a little better. Uh, in water, dissolved CO2 is only 10 micromoles per liter. Okay, so we've got 100 micromoles per mole. 
100 micromoles per liter. So we can solve these. And this is how much air can be supplied by diffusion, 117 micromoles per meter squared per second for air. So diffusion can easily supply that. Well, what is it for water? Because we've got a really thin boundary layer and we've got a low concentration, we only can get, we have less than one micromoles per meter squared per hour, okay? And we're talking about a photosynthetic rate of 10 micromoles, that's what would like to be supplied. So we can easily see, and it was pointed out by Howie, and, and, and I think Brian, because I missed that part of the, that uh, lecture with Brian, is this is why aqueous photosynthesis sometimes has to resort to the bicarbonate pump. Because the bicarbonate, there's a huge amount of bicarbonate available in seawater, okay? So marine algaes, often they completely deplete the CO2 because of this small boundary layer, there's just not enough CO2 to be supplied by diffusion. Whereas this is hardly ever a problem in, in plants photosynthesizing in air. Okay, so this is just an example of a way to think about how important is diffusion. Diffusion, unimportant. Here, diffusion is an incredibly important because it controls the supply of, of CO2. Now, I don't think how he showed you this slide. He used to show this slide in class, and so I wanted to show it to hammer home the point of how important diffusion is. Uh, Howie has done some really incredible uh, experiments uh, that, that are beautiful in design and extremely hard to carry out. And this is one of them in which they measured the uh, CO2 and oxygen profiles uh, going towards a shell and what you can e see very nicely in this is if we can measure these micro gradients, we can see these really big CO2 concentration gradients uh, as, we approach, as we approach the shells. And we can see these big oxygen diffusion profiles. And so again, the significant thing is the chemistry out here, which is easy to measure, is what we get for bulk chemistry for what is preserved in what it, the, the, the shell is seeing at the site of, of carbonate formation is what's happening in this boundary layer. And that's a very difficult concentration to make. And so that was one of the, you know, really major problem in geochemistry uh, has always been as well, we can measure these bulk solutions, but at the site where the isotopes are being fixed, what is the chemistry exactly right there? So for a very long time, we had these, in geochemistry, we just called it the vital effect, which means there's something going on. We've almost got it, but we can't quite explain it. We'll just call it the vital effect, okay? Well, this, this is the vital effect. And, 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 and to me, that, that is much of the beauty of, of, of Howie's work that, that he presented on, on, uh, on Saturday. Okay, this is vital effect, and we, we, we often need to calculate it. But for uh, aqueous organisms, this is, diffusion is incredibly important. Um, in the first lecture that I gave, I mentioned um, a paper written by Harmon Craig in 1969 about that was uh, uh, the discussion of the use of tracers in the oceans. Uh, and this is a summary of a redrawing of one of those figures. And the uh, significant thing, and we saw this in Howie's lecture, we saw how the bottom water concentration in the oceans had a certain value. The upper surface is constrained for a lot of things by atmospheric CO2. So we have these two boundary conditions. And if we go take a vertical profile in the oceans, we have 
we have this mixing zone where we have the concentration of something is determined uh, by the equilibrium of the atmosphere. We have the surface mixed layer, which really goes down to about four or 500 meters. Okay? And then we have the deep ocean. And the deep ocean in most places in the world, okay, except North Atlantic deep water formation and Antarctic <coughs> bottom water formation, everywhere else in the world is upwelling. So whatever the initial concentration is at, say, the bottom of the Pacific, we've got water going up. And it's going up at a velocity of W, okay? So the velocity of going up. And this velocity typically is somewhere between two and three meters per year, okay? So how long does it take to get from the bottom of the ocean to the mixed layer in the Central Pacific? Okay, one of Brian's Central Pacific gyres. So it's coming up at two meters a year. Had just two or three thousand years, so this pathway is, you know, from the bottom of the ocean is a couple of thousand years. So it took a thousand years to get here. So it got its North Atlantic deep water signal. It took a thousand or fifteen hundred years to get to here, and then it's another two thousand or three thousand years to get to the surface. So no wonder the oxygen minimum zone that Howie pointed out is right here. This is the oxygen minimum zone. Okay. So what, uh, one of the elegant things that in, in, in Harmon's uh, uh, 1969 paper was kind of a consideration of how important is diffusional processes, and this is not molecular diffusion, but there's another process in the ocean of mixing in which we have just as simple, the, the mixing of waters due to micro eddies and currents, and we can actually, that's another diffusion term, and it's orders of magnitude higher than molecular diffusion, but it's the diffusion of the small eddies and currents in the ocean, and that is, can be uh, uh, presented mathematically as a diffusion process. So there's this, uh, which is it more important? Is the diffusion or is the advection, the vertical velocity, more important? And so uh, if there's only, uh, if we only have uh, diffusion, we should actually have a line that goes from one, goes from here to here, okay, at, at equilibrium. The other important thing about the diagram, and this is really significant if you think about the oxygen minimum zone, is if a concentration profile of anything goes outside these two boundary conditions, there must be chemical reactions, in this case, producing that substance, like phosphate or nitrate. And if it goes down below the, the mixing line, if it actually gets more negative than, or a smaller value than anything in here, there must be consumption, like the oxygen minimum zone. Okay, so the shapes of the profiles can intuitively, immediately tell you something. You can say, yes, chemical reactions are important or, 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 or not. So I want to just, to, get that in because I've, I've found it very useful over the years when I've been worried about diffusion is to just sit back and say, okay, what's my characteristic length of the system? Uh, what's the time I need for diffusion to relax and get the signal? And this is important to me because we collect soil CO2. And so we need, if we take a soil CO2 sample or pound in a dog bone, we need to know how long do we need to wait before we can collect a sample because we've perturbed the system. So how long do we need to wait? Okay, and this is just a real handy thing that you can bring along in your head. L squared equals four dt. Doesn't take up any, very little memory space <laughs> takes up. And you can do it on the back of an envelope. You don't need to have remembered to bring a calculator or anything. It's, you know, you just need to be within a factor of 10 for most things in life. 